Good morning. We're talking about good and bad foods, how to tell, you know, which ones we should be eating more of and which ones we should be eating less of. And is there really such a thing as good foods and bad foods? This is a question that I get all the time. I talk with my clients about it. There's often like, can I get a list of foods that I should never eat? Please tell me the answers because this has got to be the reason why I'm not losing weight. Well, I'm here to give you some answers today. If we haven't met yet, hi, my name is Tessa Shears. I'm a coach for women and I help them feel empowered in their choices and drop their last 10 pounds with a system that is like step by step by step. So you know exactly what to do, exactly when, so that you're getting transformation and results. If you are here on the replay or live, I'd love for you to say hello. Let me know how you're doing. Give me a wave in the comments. I'd be happy to say hello back to you and let me know that you're here. So let's jump in. We're talking about deciding what foods are good and what foods are bad. And I mean, there's some foods that are like really obvious, right? But then there's some ones that we're not quite sure about. But here's the thing I want to share right off the bat. If you are not taking action because you're not sure if the foods that you're choosing are good or in bad, I want to tell you right now that all that's happening here, this is totally normal, but we need to recognize that we are indulging in confusion. And here's the thing, we never take action from confusion, right? If you think about it, confusion leads to overwhelm, you doubt your choices, you don't know if you'll ever be able to do it, you might not feel like you're good enough. Every time confusion comes up, we never take action from a place of confusion. We only take action from a place of commitment and determination and dedication and consistency. And these are the feelings we wanna generate. So I often find when I get the question, you know, what are the good foods and bad foods? This is indulging in that confusion. And it's, it feels like it's productive because it feels like you're getting the knowledge you need to make a proper decision so you do everything right. But all it's really doing is stopping you from actually taking the action to find out if what you're doing works or not. So here's the thing, indulging in confusion gets you nowhere. And this is something I share with my clients all the time is I always say to them like, we don't do I don't knows, we don't do I'm confused, we don't do mm, I'm not sure if this is the right idea because what that isn't is action. And the only way we find out whether something works or not is through taking action steps, right? And I know that that might seem like a great idea, but I want you to start trying it. And I am gonna be giving you some tips in this video to help you assess whether a food is more good or less good, okay? So I'm not gonna leave you completely um, on your own here, but I do want you to understand that the first step is we need to recognize that that indulgence and confusion and overwhelm and I don't know and I need to read another book and I should probably watch another video or maybe a podcast. Consuming more information does not get you results. Action does, okay? So here's the thing. We inherently know what foods are good and what foods are bad, right? I mean, if I said, to, if I put like um, a box of cookies and a piece of broccoli in front of you, you inherently know the vegetables, the fruits, all that is good. And the stuff that you're seeing in the bakery is probably not as good, right? But where we get confused are those things in the middle. Things like cereals, things like um, yogurt, things like uh, health bars or protein bars. These things get a little muddy and we don't quite know, I mean, are they going to help get us results or not? So here's the first thing I want to say right off the bat. I always like to share with my clients and I'm going to share with you that there's no such thing as a good food or a bad food. There are foods that are not optimal to put in our body and there are foods that are optimal for our body and that has a lot to do with what the food is made of. So I love the idea of dropping good foods versus bad foods. It's just food. There are foods we eat more often and foods we eat less often. Foods that optimize our health and our energy and our vibrancy and foods that tend to detract from it. You know the foods that make you wake up with stomach aches and they make you feel really bloated and you feel tired throughout the day. So I want you to think of food not as good or bad, but more about like the effect that it has on your body after you eat it. Okay, so let's think about that first. So here is the spectrum of what I like to put foods on. I like to think of one end of the spectrum as being foods that are processed or refined and then foods that are whole foods. And I like to put them on the spectrum like this. So we have processed and refined and whole foods. In general, I like to make 80 to 90% of my food choices from this whole food end. So now, one of the things that I always used to find when I was learning this concept is like, well, what does 90% mean? What does that even mean? That seems confusing, 90%, how do you evaluate that? 
So I like to think of the idea that if we have three meals in a day times seven days in a week, so say that's 20 to 21 meals. So 10% would be two meals out of those 21 meals in a week, right? So if we want to say that only 10% of our meals come from processed or refined foods, what that might look like is two of our meals, so like a, two lunches or a breakfast and a dinner, all on different days, two of those meals have processed foods in them and the rest of them are consisting of whole foods. Does that make sense? So that's kind of what I like to look at. So when I'm looking back over the span of a week, I like to say, did I keep processed foods in less than two of my meals? That's how I know I'm hitting that 90% mark for me. So having said that, now we need to start looking at, well, okay, if foods are just based on the, out, or the outcome of what happens to our body when we eat them, we need to start looking at like, okay, well, how do I know if a food is more processed and refined or more of a whole food? Um, and there's three ways I'm gonna share with you that you can tell, and there's, it's a three-point checklist when you're looking at a food. And I want to give you the example of the foods that are like um, the confusing ones. So like, for example, yogurt or, you know, cereal or granola bar. And those are the ones that are kind of marketed to us as health foods. But there's something niggling in the back of our brain being like, maybe this isn't the right answer for us. So let's take, um, let's take yogurt, for example, like a, a sweetened strawberry flavored yogurt. Because I used to eat those all the time. Okay. So the first question I like to ask myself is, is this food nature made or human made like did it have a life at one point was by nature made i mean was it ever alive or is it human made so if we're looking at a yogurt technically your brain might be like well it comes from dairy which kind of was alive but i like to classify that as not alive because a human had to take it and make it into a food. So if you think of something like an avocado, it just shows up as it is. We didn't need to make it like that because nature made it. So question one, is this food nature made or human made? If it's nature made, it's a whole food. If it's human made, it's gone through a processed or refining period. So then we start to look at the amount of processing that had to happen to get the food to what it is. Like, can you tell what it really was? So if we're looking at that yogurt again, we know that it had to go through processing to get it to this shape. I mean, when you're looking at a yogurt, can you tell what it was when it was alive? No. So what that means is it's likely more processed and more refined. So if we're looking at whole foods versus processed refined foods, the more processing a food has gone through, the more processed and refined it is, and that moves us away from whole foods. So I want you to think about this. Think about an avocado. We're going to come back to this example. You can tell exactly how it grew in nature because nothing was changed about it. So that's another one. So the, we've gone through, is it nature made or human made? The amount of processing. And the last one is the amount of packaging. The more packaging a food has, the more processed or refined it is. The less packaging it has, the more of a whole food is. So I often find that whole foods, like if you think of fruits and vegetables, and they often come in their own packaging. Bananas come in their skins, avocados come in their peels or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, some of them you eat the peels. Like a lot of our vegetables, we just eat the shell that they come in. So the more packaging a food has, so if you think about this, like that yogurt needs to be in some kind of plastic container or the bread needs to be wrapped up in a bag and then another bag and cereals come in a bag and then a box. The more packaging that exists, the more likely it is a processed or refined food. Now, I want to just note that these three guidelines are, of course, they're generalities, and there's going to be foods that fall into other categories um, that don't align with these, but these are great guidelines to ask. So when we're looking at our yogurt again, we're like, well, it's man-made. I can't really tell where it came from, and it has quite a bit of packaging. So I would put this more on the processed end food of the diet. Does this mean yogurt is a no and you should never eat it? No, of course. There is a place for it if your body likes dairy, if it works for you, and if you're getting goals, of course there's a place for it. But this is the checklist that I use with my clients to help us say, well, should we include more of these foods or not? Like, we want to be eating foods that we can recognize, that are nature-made, that come in their own packaging. These are the foods we want on the majority of those meals. The reason is, is because not only are they packed with micronutrients, plenty of, you know, vitamins and minerals, they usually have a really good balance of, of fiber in them. And on top of that, they help us balance our hormones. So if you've ever heard any of my chats with you on hormones, you'll know that 
whole foods tend to affect the hormone insulin a lot less. And the hormone insulin is what's responsible for storage of the food we eat and specifically fat storage. And when this hormone is always up, we have a hard time going into our fat stores to mobilize that fat so that we can get rid of the fat on our body so we can feel good pulling on our jeans in the morning. But the only way this can happen is if our hormones are balanced. The more processed and refined foods we eat, the more our hormones do tend to be out of balance. So that is another great reason to be eating on that whole food end of the spectrum. So at the end of the day, the thing I just want you to look at is, are you getting results? If you want to, you know, you want to trim down, maybe you want to fit a smaller dress size, maybe you want to drop a couple pounds, I would recommend thinking about first moving more of your meals towards the whole food ends of the spectrum. If you are seeing great results already and you're enjoying the body you're in, then you might have found that perfect balance already. So when you're looking at your plate, you're going to go through that three-point checklist. But the biggest thing, you guys, keep it simple. It's We inherently can tell whether something is processed or not, right? And then what I want you to do is not indulge in that confusion because we never take action from confusion. So here's how you tell. If you try a food and you don't get results, so say you took action, you included a food and you're not getting results, at least you took action because now you know that that food doesn't work. Whereas if you had waffled in confusion about good foods versus bad foods, you never would have figured that out in the first place. And even though maybe the food you chose didn't get you the results you wanted, you are one step closer to knowing what does. And it's about taking action consistently, regardless of how overwhelming you, overwhelming it feels and how confused you feel. So I really hope that that has been helpful. Um, leave me a comment below and let me know if that was helpful or share this with someone who might be in a bit of confusion right now. I mean, it's completely normal. We are overwhelmed with the amount of information telling us exactly what to eat, how much to eat, and when to eat, when I really just think it needs to be scaled down to like, what is the outcome of our body when we eat these foods? It's different for all of us. If you've been here before, you know that broccoli and quinoa make me bloated, but they're healthy foods. And the only way I found that out was by taking action and not being like, well, I don't know about quinoa. Maybe I should just not change anything, right? You see what I'm saying? So. Um, having said that, you guys, if you're enjoying this type of content and you're taking action on it and you're seeing transformation, if you want to take that transformation one step further, I would love for you to direct message me on this platform here and let's set up a chat about what working together would be like. So what I do is I work with women one-on-one -on -one to help them put a meal planning system on autopilot find out the exact plan that we need to be dropping the weight we want to feel good in our jeans. And then what I have you do is learn the habits and the skills that are the important ones. So like, here's the thing. You need to know how to deal with the office donut at 3 p.m. on a Friday. So it's way more than about just the meal plans I teach you and how to eat for your body and whole foods and timing. It's also about the mindset part of it, about believing that you can achieve these results and not indulging in confusion and knowing how to stay committed no matter what, no matter who puts a donut on your desk, how to prioritize your goals. And I work with women on that and that is how we create transformation because it's about more than what we put in our mouth and about how we move our body. It's also about how we treat ourselves, how we talk to ourselves, how we, have conversations with ourselves about our goals and you know when we're staring into the pantry at 9 p.m. at night and all you want to do is eat cookies what does that conversation look like and what do you do when all you want to do is just grab cookies so that's the kind of work that I do in my one-on-one -on -one sessions and if that is something you know that feels like it's aligned with you and you are ready for that next level of transformation in your life I would love for you to either comment below me 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 or you know send me a message and we can set up a free chat um, where we can just get on and talk about if this is something that is where you're ready in your life to take on that next step and you want to know how to get there in the fastest way possible without all of this trial and error from, you know, a coach that has been doing this for over 10 years, working with women to help them lose weight and feel amazing in their bodies. So I hope you guys have a really great week and I will be looking forward to jumping back in here this week and sharing, you know, the stories and the successes and all of the great tips that are helping you move forward with your health. Have a beautiful Wednesday and take care.